Our presenter today is Dr. Ann Musser, DO. She is my primary care physician. I go to Providence Family Medicine Center, and when my doctor was going to retire, I said, what am I going to do? And he said, I suggest Ann Musser. I think you'd, you'd like her. She's a DO. And I said, what's a DO? So I figured since I didn't know, maybe other people wouldn't know the differences between allopathic and osteopathic medicine, which is what she's going to talk about today. She is the medical director of the family, Providence Family Medical, Medi medical, see I wrote it up, medicine, it's not the medical center, it's the medicine center at 36th and Latouche. She's also associate director of re the residency program. They have 36 residents. Um, she came from Southern California. When she was becoming a doctor, she did a medical student rotation in 1984 in Bethel. And that's where she fell in love with Alaska, Bethel. So she moved back oh, January and February in Bethel, by the way. Uh, but she fell in love with Alaska there and moved back in 2005. Um, when she's not busy doing all the things she does for Providence, she's outdoors with her dogs skiing or hiking. Um, so please welcome Dr. Ann Musser. After she speaks, we'll be open for questions. song about osteopathic medicine I've ever heard. I'm still trying to get over it. <laughs> okay, it's the only song. When Wendy said she was going to do a song about osteopathic medicine, I thought it was going to be sort of head, shoulders, knees, and toes. <laughs> yeah. So can you hear me? I'm not used to standing in front of a microscope. Micro microphone. Can I hold it? Yeah. That might be better. Then I can move around and I don't think so. There we go. All right. Let's see how that works. All right. So, as Wendy said, yeah. Into the mic. Into the mic. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. So, as Wendy said, um, I'm Ann Buster. I'm an osteopathic physician, a family medicine doctor, which is important because not all DOs are family physicians, and it's pretty hard to tell in my practice, in my life, in my career, um, the. Um, where family medicine starts and where osteopathic medicine starts. So uh, you'll hear me talk a lot about both. Um, it's one of my favorite topics. I can talk about it forever. And uh, let me tell you what I'm planning today. I want to talk a little bit about the history and philosophy of osteopathic medicine, um, answer some of those questions that we talked about. Okay, hopefully that will work. Um, yeah, so talk a little bit about the history and philosophy of education, what the differences are between the education of the osteopathic physicians who are DOs and the allopathic physicians who are MDs. Um, talk a little bit about what science um, and the art that is, forms the basis of our profession. Um, maybe talk a little bit about what this means for our patients, our residency, and our hospital. And if we have a little bit of time, I'd like to do some hands-on demonstration because I think that that kind of helps you understand a little bit more about what we do. So a little bit of history. Andrew Taylor Still, you can see the dates of his um, life there. Um, and he's the founder of osteopathic medicine. And I like to give a little bit of history about family medicine, or about um, medicine, because it's important for, to me to have you understand that osteopathic medicine is not just sort of something that showed up um, in the late 1900s and, and early 2000s when everybody was trying to find an alternative to um, the usual medicine. Too many pills, too many procedures, and all of that. Lots of complementary, lots of alternative types of medicine showed up at that time. Uh, but that's not what osteopathic medicine is about. Um, osteopathic medicine was developed in the late 1800s by Andrew Taylor Still. And medicine at that time, medical education um, was not like it is now in medical. There were medical schools. There's Johns Hopkins, and there's some schools over in um, Europe that were pretty classic, typical um, educational um, places like. Uh, we currently have, uh, but most of medical education was apprenticeship. Um, either your 
parent or a friend or a mentor was a physician, you thought that was a good idea, and so you just did an apprenticeship with them and learned medicine through um, apprenticeship model. Public health. Um, this was back again, um, not that long ago, but the real keys to, um, to health at this time were just some pretty simple things like hygiene um, and sanitation, um, keeping sewer away from clean water, uh, those kinds of things. Um, and life expectancy, and this is kind of a, a, a term that a lot of people misunderstand, but life expectancy in um, the mid-1800s um, was about 46 years for um, men and about 48 years for women. That doesn't mean most people died at 46 or 48. It means that there was lots of infant, infant, infant mortality, lots of deaths in early childhood from infections, lots of death in uh, middle and young age from um, accidents and injuries. And so uh, people who live past their childhood often lived into their 70s or 80s. The life expectancy in general was in the 40s, um, and life expectancy now is just about 80. The big difference in life expectancies from then till now is not you know, major accomplishments in medicine, it's major accomplishments in public health. Causes of death, infections and injuries, I don't know about Dementors, didn't even learn about Dementors until Harry Potter came out, so I'm not sure that there's any evidence to say that there was or wasn't Dementors at that time. <laughs> Therapeutic modalities um, were based um, on trying to get whatever was evil or whatever was bad, whatever was calling Ill causing illness out of you. So bleeding, either by sticking a needle in your vein and taking blood out or giving, putting leeches on and having them suck the blood out, purging, making you throw up or, or poop out um, diseases. Um, were the usual therapeutic modali modalities and as you might imagine, they weren't very helpful. The germ theory, not yet around. People understood that there were these things that they called little animals or um, germs, but they didn't really relate them to disease yet. So that wasn't, um, antibiotics were not um, used a lot at this point, in this point of time. Antibiotics and immunizations would come later than this. So I say all of this because, yeah, again, Andrew Taylor still, who was a physician during this time, um, had three small children die of infections. He had to sit there and watch his children die, and he kind of realized that what um, he had in his doctor bag was not very effective. What his therapy modalities were not very effective. He thought that there must be something more to this whole medicine thing. So he went back to the drawing board, spent a lot of time with um, cadavers, studying the body, studying the musculoskeletal system, and he came up with a philosophy, now known as osteopathic medicine, and that philosophy is that the body is a unit, that the person is a unit of mind, body, and spirit. The body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and health maintenance. That structure and function are interrelated, and that rational treatment is based on those other things. So this is the first time that they put into, he put into words that the body, the human being, is a, a unit of mind, body, and spirit, and that we need to pay attention to the mind, the body, and the spirit if we're going to maintain health. The other really important thing here was, that was different from other physicians of his day, was that the body is capable of self-regulation, self-healing, and health maintenance. So his idea was that if we could, we as physicians, could help the body be aligned, in his words, the structure and the function would align and the body would do the healing, the body would heal itself. This is different than Daniel Palmer, who was uh, another physician of uh, about the same time, who was going also unhappy with what was happening in, in medicine. Um, he went back, um, did many of the same kinds of studies as Andrew Taylor still, and he came up with a chiropractic model of healing. About the same time, many of the same kinds of ideas, um, but um, in Chiropractic medicine, the idea was that if you aligned the nerves, the spinal cord, the spinal um, nerves, that that would heal. The physician would heal the body through the um, use of manipulation. It's a little bit of a subtle difference, uh, but it's an important difference uh, to our profession. What we're trying to do is to align the structure and the function of the body um, so that the body can heal itself. So back to a little bit of history. Andrew Taylor still um, founded his first American School of Osteopathic 
Kirksville, uh, Missouri in, in 1892. Um, and in World War I, you know, whatever that was, 20 years later, um, physician, osteopathic physicians were not considered physicians and they, were, they went to war and were soldiers just like everybody else. They were not used as physicians in World War I. In World War II, we'd been around long enough that they recognized that we were physicians, but didn't really know what to do with us. So they left us here um, at home, and the physicians, the MDs, went um, across seas and, and uh, practiced medicine in the war. Um, and then in Vietnam in the 1960s, that was the first time that the government recognized osteopathic physicians. And as in many social um, issues, uh, the military, when the military has accepted the osteopathic uh, physicians, then it be the government did, and then the insurance companies did, and the hospitals did, and uh, we became much more mainstream uh, in the 1960s. So since that time, we've had sort of a parallel development. It's an interesting development. We try hard um, to maintain our distinction. Our distinction is that um, we continue to think that the mind, body, and spirit are important, structure and function, and manipulation, osteopathic manipulation, are important parts, tools in our practice. Um, so we hang on to those, but we also um, embrace all of the other things that are happening in medicine, antibiotics and the surgeries and all of the other um, um, improvements that medicine has made over the years and it's um, been a little bit difficult to try to prove that we're just as good as MDs without becoming MDs which is something that's very important to us in our profession. Um, some of the differences is that most osteopathic physicians go into primary care. About 60% go into family medicine, internal medicine, or pediatrics um, and that's very different than in our allopathic brethren who it's usually considered about less than 20% or 10, between 10 and 20% of people go into primary care. Um, and in state licensure, again, history, um, some states have separate licensing boards. I have licenses in Arizona and California. They both have separate licensing boards. Alaska is one of the states where both MDs and DOs are licensed through the same board. But all 50 states have unlimited practice. So. Osteopathic physicians, although we practice and we, we tend to be primary care, so family medicine, internal medicine, and pediatrics, we can become you know, pediatric neuroendocrinologists if we want to, just like uh, MD can become a good family physician if they want to. But the professions, individual can become anything he or she wants, but the profession is quite a bit different. We lean much more toward primary care and the allopaths much more toward um, specialties and subspecialties. It's been interesting to me, having grown up as a middle-class white person all of my life, um, to become part of a minority culture. Um, and it's very interesting to be a minority culture where, again, we're trying to prove that we are just as good as the majority culture without losing our special um, things that make us special and make us different. These are some enrollment projections for allopathic, allopathic, allopathic and osteopathic uh, first year enrollments. You'll see that the MDs over the course of the year, or these years um, are increasing enrollment by about 21%. The DOs about 79%. So in terms of numbers, we're still smaller, but our growth is considerably higher. So now one out of 10 physicians is an osteopathic physician. Um, we take care of about one out of every six patients. And again, that's because we're primary care, and so we're taking care of lots and lots of patients while some of our MDs, brethren, are, taking, are in research or education or things that don't have direct patient care. So there's more MDs, but we're taking care of a higher percentage of the patients. It's also one in five medical students, 20% are now in osteopathic school, so you'll see more and more about osteopathic um, physicians. We have 25, actually now it's 30 colleges in 22 states. That's compared to about 140 allopathic or MD schools. Um, we graduate about 40,000 about 40, about 4, graduates a year um, in all the medical disciplines. And as Wendy said, 25% of new osteopathic students are non-traditional students. And what I mean by non-traditional, 
um, a traditional medical student, went to high school, graduated, went to college for four years, um, and um, majored in a science, uh, biology or chemistry usually, and then medical school, so very traditional 12-year um, education. In osteopathic medicine, 25% um, of us are non-traditional, um, which means that we're often um, second career, so people who majored in music and then found their calling in medicine at a later age. People who have grown up, had children, um, and are teachers and decided to go back and get their degree. Uh, people who decided to go into the Peace Corps or whatever, um, took some sort of uh, um, some time off of the traditional medical education. But that does for me as a, as a teacher, as a faculty person, is it's a much more interesting, more heterogeneous um, group of people to practice with and they tend to have um, more life experience and don't take grades quite so seriously and they're kind of, I don't know, a fun group of people to work with. I think I keep skipping over things possible. Is previous go back down. <laughs> the mentors here. There we go. How about that? <laughs> How about if we just use this one? All right. Um, so um, some current issues in our profession. Again, a minority profession. Uh, we're trying to hard hard to um, prove our worthiness, but maintain our um, specialness. Um, ACGME, which is the medical, um, the MD. Um, licensing um, group for medical education um, and the AOA which is the osteopathic licensing um, for um, graduate medical education are proposing a unified accreditation system um, which uh, we have sort of mixed feelings about the MDs think hey great this is terrific we're going to be unified um, and the DOs are going, wait a second, um, you know, when you've got a majority culture and a minority culture and they come together, um, sometimes it's the minorities that lose. So we're a little bit worried about that, but that's a possibility. Uh, and uh, do you call ourselves osteopaths or osteopathic physicians? Osteopath is the traditional one. Osteopathic physician is kind of more mainstream. Um, family medicine, for a number of years, uh, family medicine, uh, Fewer and fewer people were going into family medicine across the board, both MD and DO, for a wide variety of reasons. That's changed recently, um, and we're seeing the number of people going into family medicine in both the MD world and the DO world go up. Um, I showed you the slides that showed a huge increase in the number of students that we have. We do not have a huge increase in the number of residency slots. I don't know if you guys know this, but the re number of residency slots is um, Stagnant. We can't have more residency slots in the MD or the DO world right now um, since 1990-something, can't remember. Um, there's a cap, what's called a cap, and each hospital has a certain number of residencies that they can have, but they can't go above that. So when the United States says, hey, we need more doctors, and the medical student schools respond by having enrolling more students, it becomes a block when it gets up to um, residency because there are no more residency slots. We can't have more residency slots. So put out all the, all the students that we want, but we can't train them in residencies right now, which hopefully will change. And the number of osteopathic residency slots um, has really taken a hit because a lot of our osteopathic schools were in small areas and community hospitals, and those small areas and community hospitals closed at a greater rate than the big hospitals in big urban areas uh, because uh, they were taken over by, you know, big hospital conglomerates and, um, and, and the residencies were closed. So the decreasing numbers of re osteopathic residency slots, increasing number of students, which is not a sustainable model. OMT, osteopathic manipulative treatment. Must have hit some slides here that I didn't, uh, didn't get to the slides. Osteopathic manipulative treatment um, is, um, is a modality that we use um, to treat um, what we identify as somatic dysfunctions or
This one? Yeah. This one came with the, with the duct tape already on it. <laughs> OMD or osteopath manipulation um, is um, a treatment modality used to align um, the structure of the body, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, and then another current issue in our profession is there's lots and lots of information right now about evidence-based medicine. You want everything to be evidence-based in medicine right now. That's how we practice medicine. Um, and there's not a lot of research in osteopathic manipulative therapy for a couple of reasons. It's hard to do a double-blind study in OMT, you know, because either you're doing manipulation or you're not, and people can tell. So it's kind of hard to tell, um, hard to do a double-blind study. The other thing is that most medical research nowadays is funded by um, the pharmace pharmaceutical companies um, to prove that their medicine is as good or better than other medicines, and um, there's no real reason for a um, pharmaceutical company to want to fund osteopathic manipulative therapy that might show that manipulation is just as good as medicine, which is not in their best interest. So why haven't you heard it? If we're so great, we're increasing numbers, why haven't you heard more about us? Well, let me tell you. This is Dr. Jadik. Um, this is a Newsweek magazine from um, 2006, the Iraq War, and this guy is just like a hero, hero physician. He went to Iraq, he's a urologist, a surgical subspecialty uh, specialist. He went to, he was drafted, he went to Iraq um, and made some huge changes in the way that they treat wounded warriors close to the front line. Saved lots of lives, made some big differences, and got like a 12-page spread in Newsweek magazine talking about what a great guy he was. And because you know the topic of this conversation, you might recognize that on page 22, the next week, they apologized for calling him a hero MD because he's in fact a hero DO. So the correction on page 22 the following week um, just talks a little bit about the fact that he is a DO and what osteopathic physicians are. It was a huge lost opportunity for our profession. We could have had hero doctor on it and everybody would have known about osteopathic medicine, but it was a lost opportunity. And then Providence, my employer, um, puts out this Providence Care Community Benefit Report every year, and we are pleased to see our residents in it this year. Uh, we have Emily Boss and Christy Tuwami, both Alaska uh, born and bred people, longtime family, um, Alaskan families who went away to medical school, osteopathic medical school, and came back to do their residency here with us at Providence, um, and now have graduated and are both in small rural areas in Alaska, which is the mission of our residency program, is to get people to go into small places and, and you know, take care of rural Alaska. And her, her parents are vets. Tuami's parents are vets, yep. Yeah. They, um, parents are married. Yeah, and, um, and siblings, I think. It's a whole veterinary family. Yeah, that's Tuami. And then um, Emily Boss's father is a surgeon at Native Hospital. And, you know, they listed them both as MDs when, in fact, they're DOs. So, again, an opportunity for our community to learn about osteopathic medicine um, that was blown by, uh, our, by us. So, what do we do? We consider ourselves the complete physician. Um, I can do everything that an MD can do and more because I have osteopathic manipulation in my doctor bag, which is nice. We are primary care, more than, primary care more than specialties, as I mentioned. We spend a fair amount of time doing a structural exam. If you haven't gone to an osteopathic physician who's going to do manipulation, you might be surprised at the amount of time um, that they spend doing a structural exam and seeing um, what your muscular musculoskeletal system feels like and how it moves. And then we do osteopathic manipulative treatments. Again, hopefully I'll have a chance to show some of those um, where we try to um, improve the mobility and the function of the musculoskeletal system. So again, here's our philosophy. Probably when I started, structure and function are related interrelated was most important to me. I thought that was a really important thing that we didn't really get from our allopathic um, trainers. Uh, now I think that probably the body is capable of self-healing and self-maintenance. Um, health maintenance is probably the most important philosophy in, in my personal practice. So somatic dysfunction. 
Um, impaired or altered function of related components of the body. Um, muscle and bones is what you think about, are what we think about. Um, but the other thing is um, that it's the related blood vessels, lymphatic drainage, and nerves that are affected as well. So when I'm working on somebody's back and trying to get the muscles to relax or getting the bones into the right position, um, yeah, that feels good, but really the important thing is that the blood vessels now can go unimpeded to the muscles. Um, the lymphatics can be unimpeded, so the edema in the area goes away, and the nerve function um, is brought back to uh, normal. You see here, this is just an example of um, how complex the body is. So red are the arteries, blue are the veins, so red arteries taking the blood away from the heart, blue veins taking the blood back to the heart, the yellow are the nerves, um, and let's see, that sort of odd color is the um, lymphatic uh, drainage. So you can see that this is the clavicle, comes out here, they cut out a piece so you can see everything that goes underneath it. If that clavicle were raised up or pushed down, let's say pushed down for the sake of uh, discussion, pulled down by say this muscle, this big bicep, this big um, muscle in the arm here, if that was pulled down for whatever reason, you can imagine that it would smush everything under it and cause um, problems. Um, pain, which is uh, one reason that we do manipulation, but also um, impair um, uh, the vascular, impair um, circulation in nerves. Another example I'd like to give is this one because a lot of people have problems with this. This is a sciatic nerve. It comes from um, in the upper back. It comes down here, it goes through underneath the piriformis muscle, which is one of the muscles kind of deep in the buttocks. Um, and then it goes down here and down the leg. Imagine that if the piriformis muscle was all tight because you've been running or jogging or riding bikes or doing whatever it is that we do, um, if that were really tight, that would squeeze the sciatic nerve. And if we could figure out a way of making that muscle um, go back into the right position, then the pressure would come off the sciatic nerve and you wouldn't have sciatic nerve pain anymore. So, in an allopathic world, you can use moist heat, that helps muscles relax. You can use um, muscle relaxants, that helps muscles relax. You can use some stretching exercises, you can use physical therapy, there's lots of things that you can do. You can use pain medicines. In an osteopathic world, you can do all of those same things, and you can do manipulation, which is putting the body into a position where we can get that muscle to go back into its normal um, position. So science, science and art, when I'm feeling, when I'm doing my structural exam and, and feeling your body to see what's going on, um, I look for what we call TART, tissue, tissue texture abnormalities. When you feel somebody's back, and you can do this with you know, a loved one if you want, feel their back, um, both sides of their um, vertebral column, you can tell if, there's, if it feels the same color, and feel, looks the same color, feels the same temperature, if it feels doughy, if it feels hard, if it feels crusty, you can tell that there's a difference. Um, asymmetry of the position, um, so one side sticks out more than the other. Um, restriction of motion, um, you need to see if there's mobility in all of the joints. And then tenderness, which is what the patients usually tell you about. Ah. Um, so manipulation um, is designed to take that somatic dysfunction that I've just discovered by looking at the, yeah. Okay. Maybe I could do just some of these guys, huh? Yeah. There we go. So manipulation is designed to restore the function, which I just talked about. And then, um, yeah, so next slide. And then types of OMT um, techniques. So the top one, high velocity, low amplitude thrust, that's sort of the snap, crackle, pop that is pretty typical of um, a chiropractor. That was one of um, Dr. Still's first types of manipulation. A lot of chiropractors still do um, a lot of that. And it's very useful and um, helps a lot. Muscle energy is um, a, a more subtle kind of manipulation. I use it a lot because the patient's in charge then, so they can decide how far they, they want to push and how far they want to go, how far they want to, um, how much they want to be uncomfortable. 
Um, soft tissue techniques are sort of feel like massage. You can see the rest of them. And then fascial distortion models, a very interesting model that we just started to use not too long ago. Um, and Byron Perkins, I don't know if you know him, he's an osteopathic physician in South Anchorage, a very strong proponent of the fascial distortion model. It's an interesting model because all, of all the other, from it's different than all the other ones because it doesn't, um, because it's designed to hurt, and it does hurt. Um, but it's also very, very, if you have like plantar fasciitis, I used to just pull my hair out about plantar fasciitis. It's a really hard thing to treat. And now we have a treatment that I can treat it in minutes, and it's gone. Um, so it's called fascial distortion um, treatment, and very helpful, very useful in things like plantar fasciitis, tennis elbow, um, those kinds of pains where people come and say, it hurts right here, and point to one very sore spot, um, or it hurts in a band, all of those kinds of things. Very, very useful uh, model. All right, next slide. He took the thing away from me. What does this mean <laughs> to our patients, our residencies? Okay, next. So what does this mean to our patients? So if a patient comes into me at the uh, Providence Family Medicine Center where I work, um, and they see one of my MD colleagues, um, that, and the person's complaining of low back pain, the good MD will take a chief complaint, work up a history of present illness, talk about the pain, asking about the onset, and um, the quality of the pain, the um, sort of progression of the pain, all of the different questions that we ask about pain. Um, ask about red flags that would make us think that this is more than just a somatic dysfunction. Uh, and if everything seemed to be okay, we didn't have to do anything to follow up the scary red flags, then they do a musculoskeletal exam, a neuro exam, um, maybe abdomen um, and gynecological exam if, if that seemed to be appropriate. The diagnosis would be low back pain and the treatment would be conservative care, meaning that they would have you rest, maybe take some Tylenol or stronger pain medicine, muscle relaxants, um, uh, again, physical therapy, exercises, ice, that kind of stuff. I, if you were lucky enough to get an osteopathic physician, they would do exactly the same thing, but in the, in the objective um, section, they would do a structural exam and see if they could find out what kind of somatic dysfunction was causing this pain. Um, and then in addition to doing all of the other conservative care, they could do manipulation and hopefully you'd walk out feeling better. So it's a more immediate kind of um, relief. All right, next. Hands-on demonstration. So I skipped some slides in there and I'm trying to think of what I skipped that, that might be important for you to, oh, I know, the, um, the education. So. Um, Osteopathic schools and allopathic schools are different. They're not, you don't go to an allopathic school and then study longer to become an osteopathic physician or vice versa. They're separate schools. There's MD schools and there's DO schools. The two that are most important to our state are University of Washington. There's the WAMI program. A lot of our, um, our um, medical students from this state go to the WAMI program and are educated at University of Washington. There's another school called Pacific Northwest University, which is the osteopathic school in Yakima, um, Washington, um, and a lot of our students go there and become osteopathic physicians. Um, obviously, Alaska residents go all over the place, but those are kind of the two main ones um, in, um, in Washington for Alaska. Um, both MD and DO schools are four years. They all require four years of uh, undergraduate education. Um, and then people apply to either the DO schools or the MD schools or both. They go where they get in, basically. Um, and then there's four years of medical school. The first two years tend to be mostly basic science, although they're incorporating some clinical medicine in there. In them. And then the last two years are clinical rotations that the students are out in clinics um, and hospitals and, and learning hands-on um, styles, uh, hands-on um, medicine. In osteopathic world, there, in addition to all of the anatomy and physiology and all the kinds of things that are sort of similar to what they learn in the MD schools, there's four to six hundred hours of osteopathic manipulation, so hands-on structural exams and OMT. Um, and uh, so when people graduate from an osteopathic school, they've already had many, many hours of being taught and tested um, about osteopathic medicine. Um, then we do our residencies. And in family medicine, which is 
what I am and what our residency is here at Providence. It's a three-year residency program. And these, in, at Providence, our residency program is dual accredited. So both DOs and MDs can go there and they can be board certified after their residency in either um, MD world or the DO world. Or the DOs can be both boarded in both the MDs and the DO um, certification. Some residencies are only MD, some residencies are only DO. We happen to be dual accredited. Um, and then the different um, specialties, you know, um, our surgeries and medical spe subspecialties have different lengths of their residency programs. And that, the residency program, is what the ACGME and the AOA are thinking about unifying so that all residencies would be MD and DO um, certified. So that's the, one of the, again, issues that we had in, in the profession. So I want to save a little bit of time to do some um, examples, but questions about osteopathic medicine, family medicine, Providence, Obamacare? <laughs> yes. I'm having trouble seeing the difference between that and chiropractor. Yeah, so the question is the difference between osteopathic manipulation and chiropractic manipulation. Um, there's also physical therapists who do some manipulation. There's massage therapists who do yeah. similar kinds of hands-on physical um, stuff. A big difference is the philosophy or, or why we're doing it. In the osteopathic, the chiropractic world, the chiropractic chiropractors um, focus on the spinal um, column and the spinal nerves that come out um, of the spinal column, trying to free them up or get them um, unimpaired so that, um, and, and that is um, supposed to heal what ails you, right? Again, right now, both osteopathic manipulation and chiropractic manipulation are used primarily for pain although there's all sorts of other things that we can use manipulation for. Um, we can use it for uh, breathing, so people who have asthma often get really tight chest um, muscles or, or the muscles between their ribs and we get those to relax so that they can breathe better. Uh, people with congestive heart failure who have swelling in their legs, we get lymphatic um, drainage to go back uh, so, that the lymphs, the, so that the drainage goes away. Um, Babies who have colic or um, adults who have post-op ileus where the small bowel slows down. There's visceral manipulation that we can use um, for that. So in answer to your question, some of the techniques are similar, um, but the um, thought or the, the what we're trying to do is a little bit different. And chiro um, osteopathic physicians tend to have sort of more um, different types of manipulation rather than just spinal manipulation. And a chiropractor is not a doctor. A chiropractor is a doctor of chiropractic medicine, but not a full scope physician. So the only two full scope physicians in the United States are MDs and DOs. They can have, do everything. Um, chiropractic um, physicians can do only chiropractic medicine. In some states, I think they're beginning to um, be able to uh, prescribe some medicines, but it's not full scope. Yeah. And you had a question? Yeah. Um, well, I've got a lot of thoughts and opinions. Um, first off, I'll quote a book called Do You Believe in Magic uh, that has a concept of there isn't naturopathic medicine and Western medicine and alternative medicine, but there's just medicine that works and medicine that doesn't work. Um, and I subscribe to that idea uh, that we can science-based pretty much most modalities, including I think you could create a double-blind study for some of the manipulation techniques. Um, some of the ones you listed, like cranial, facial, and uh, straight, counter strain, have been shown to have benefits and should definitely be used by any provider that is looking to benefit their patients. I guess I wanted to ask you if you knew what percentage of DOs are still doing any manipulation themselves after their training. That's a really good question, and it's a, a, a lower percentage than we in the profession want. And part of that reason is that although we get four to 600 hours in our first two years of medical school, when we've got them on campus and we're really training them, they go out, the students go out and do rotations all over the place. And if they, if they happen to go and work with a good osteopathic physician who continues to do manipulation, they're likely to continue to do manipulation. If they do a residency that is either DO um, accredited or dual accredited, they're likely to continue to do manipulation. But if they go out of, after their second year of medical school, 
do their third and fourth year clinical rotation someplace where they're only MDs, and then do a residency for three years where they're only MDs, they're five years out and are unlikely to do much manipulation. So that's important. The other thing is it depends, of course, on what kind of um, medicine they go into. So we have um, a pediatric cardiologist at, um, two actually, pediatric cardiologists at Providence who are DOs. They don't do manipulation on their patients, but they do do manipulation when we all get together and talk about osteopathic things. Um, so they still have the skills, but really there aren't a whole lot of manipulations that um, are practical in their world. So it kind of depends on what they do and um, where they were trained. And we're trying very hard to get people to um, do more. Meanwhile, so that's the osteopathic world. The allopathic world are starting to do more because they're calling it physical medicine, but realizing that there is something there that is important. They're not calling it osteopathic manipulation, of course, but they're calling it physical medicine and are starting to do more and more um, structural exams and manipulation or physical medicine. Yeah? Why is there a limitation on residencies and how many graduates are waiting for a residency? It's a really interesting question. So it was 19, either late 80s or 90s. It was a big study that came out um, that showed that the United States would be overrun by physicians. <laughs> and this is kind of like gets back to the whole evidence-based medicine, right? Today's evidence-based medicine is going to be tomorrow's joke, right? Um, in some ways, right? But there was a big study that showed that the United States would be overrun by, um, by physicians. And graduate medical education is paid for through Medicare. That's who pays for graduate medical education. I don't know if you guys knew that, but that is. So federal government worried about too many physicians um, and the thought of having to pay for all of them. So it put a cap on how many physicians there could be. And shortly after that, like, you know, two decades later, not a really long time, or maybe a decade later, um, you know, they pointed out the flaws of that study. And now it's generally um, understood that there aren't going to be nearly enough physicians, especially not in the primary care world, and especially not um, like geriatricians, people who take care of our aging population. So now they're trying to kind of go back on that, but um, the federal government has been really um, pushing back. Problem is probably there, there are probably enough slots, residency slots across the United States, but there, um, a vast majority of them are subspecialties, subspecialties, and we don't need those, we need primary care. So we need to sort of figure out how to switch that. Providence is capped at 27, I believe, residents. Um, so the Medicare will pay for 27 residents, and Providence, who um, thinks that the residency program is um, worthwhile, and the state of Alaska, who has benefited greatly from our residency program because our residents go and practice throughout Alaska, um, pay for the other nine residents, nine or 12, I can't remember. It's either we either capped at 24 or 27, we have 36, and Providence and the state pay for the other residents because um, they think it's so important. Yeah, great question. Yeah. As a DO, do you, um, are you as informed as uh, an MD would be on the whole uh, pharmacopoeia realm of medicine? Yeah, so the question is, you know, are MDs and DOs um, equally as well educated about, you know, all the pharmacy and all of the new medicines and all of that stuff? And, you know, the answer is um, yes. Um, we have the same pharmacology res um, books and, and classes and all of that stuff. Um, we use the same medicines. I'd love to be able to say that I don't need medicines because I do it all with my hands, but that's not true at all. Um, I use medicines all the time. Um, I just, um, I, again, I have all of the medicines in my bag of tricks and I have this additional manipulation that I can use when I want to use it. So. Other questions? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It seems like allopathy is the, uh, is the problem with the rising cost of medicine in the country, whereas osteopathy is the solution. And, uh, <laughs> Yes. <laughs> and yet, allopath is uh, running the show. And yeah. So again, you know, majority um, versus minority culture. Um, there are some really great things about um, traditional allopathic medicine. They've, you know, really increased um, 
um, our medical knowledge and, and their researchers are an important part of the whole system. Um, but right now, when you look at what is happening in the United States, specialists and subspecialists are, we have way too many of them in concentrated in urban areas, which is really the only place that they can practice because um, that's where they have all the patients, right? Um, and so um, there's a huge um, need for primary care physicians, both MDs and DOs in um, other parts of the country, taking care of patients. And, um, you know, not, not that this is supposed to be a, a commercial for Providence, but um, taking care of the community, right? Um, because the patients who come into my office um, are in my office um, for a half an hour, half an hour with me. Um, every three months or something like that, and the whole rest of their life, they're out making decisions that they that are important to their health care, um, what they eat, what they do, um, you know, all of those kinds of things. Um, so we need to have a much broader view of medicine to include not only what happens in the doctor-patient relationship in an exam room, but what happens outside of the exam room and in the community. Um, and I think that that's probably, hopefully, where health care will go is they'll start um, paying more attention to what's available in the community, and we hope, yeah, yes? So you mentioned that osteopathy has like all of the same bag of tricks and then pluses manipulation. Is there anything that you feel osteopathy loses out on by focusing so much on the manipulation and less on the other? Yeah, so um, for those of you who might not hear, um, if we're doing 400 to six hours, 600 hours of osteopathic training in medical school and then we continue to do it through our training, what are we missing out on? Um, I, I don't think that there is anything. Um, I, I practiced, I, I taught in an osteopathic school, a private osteopathic school in Southern California for a really long time, um, and had, having gone to an osteopathic school and then t taught at an osteopathic school, I didn't really realize um, the difference um, between an osteopathic school and an allopathic school. Then I went to teach at the University of California in family medicine um, and realized that in the osteopathic world, almost all private schools all focused on the medical student and giving them the best education that they could have. Um, it was very different in an allopathic world at the UC system where research is the focus. That's where the money is. That's where... Um, the focus is, that's where the fame is um, for, uh, for a um, medical school. And the medical students were really relegated to kind of, you know, down in the basement behind the pathology lab um, with, you know, the old AV equipment and stuff like that. So that was a big change. I don't think that it was worse necessarily, but it was less personalized um, kind of an education. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. I think there, there are some number. I don't think you've intended them to be tricks, but that were displayed. In the same limit of number of residencies, there was also with that study a limitation of number of allopathic medical schools, which then allowed for a growth in the DO schools, which may represent some of your growth in the percentage of applicants and the percentage of graduates. Um, and the United States has, since it's limited the number of doctors being trained, addressed shortages of doctors by making the foreign medical education exam easier or harder based on our internal needs, such that during the Vietnam War, when we had a shortage of MDs in the US, we brought in a lot more foreign docs, which is why in that age group, you see people who are physicians practicing here in this country that came over in the early 70s in response to that. So I, I think that there's a, there is a difference between DOs and MDs, and that's not what I'm trying to argue, but there's, um, it, the original founder of Diaz, my understanding is he believed he could shake uh, scarlet fever out of infants. Like, that was in his biography. So, I think there's some root in where medicine was back then, and the overlap with what Diaz are doing today. Because most Diaz are practicing about it in the situation as physicians prescribing medications, getting lab tests, getting a CT scan. Right. So again, the, the philosophy, Andrew Taylor still didn't feel like he could cure scarlet fever. That's kind of a, it, it, it's an important difference. He felt that if he could um, improve the structure and the function of the child, that the body would cure the scarlet fever. So 
if you could improve the circulation, if you could improve the lymph drainage and, and, and such, then it would cure the scarlet fever. So obviously there's a lot of stuff that's happened since he was practicing, like the germ theory. And so we have a lot better idea of what um, we're talking about now, but part of the um, osteopathic philosophy now would be, gosh, if you're gonna give him an antibiotic, let's make sure that the circulation is getting to the parts of the body that they need to um, get the circulation to, right? So manipulation would become important so that the circulation would be important. So it's kind of a fine line, but you're right. The, the um, information about the allopathic and the osteopathic um, medical schools um, students is, is right. So what happened was that when they capped the graduate programs, they also did not want the schools, um, at that time they were really focused on the allopathic schools, to increase the number of um, of physicians who were coming out. Um, and now, when they've realized that we need more doctors, they've asked um, the medical community, MDs and DOs, um, to increase the population, the physicians by about 30%. That slide that I had, the, the MDs were going up about 21%, so they're not quite there yet, um, and the osteopathic world is higher than that and probably going to level out. We've, um, we're kind of coming to an end of, of that really high growth. So hopefully we'll be able to. Yeah? Um, how do you characterize a scoliosis? Would that be um, a somatic dysfunction? And how would something like that be treated? Yeah, so scoliosis, which is an abnormal lateral curvature, a curvature of the spine. So looking at the back of a spine, it should go straight up and down. Looking from the side, you have the uh, forward curve at the neck, the backward curve at the thoracics, and the um, forward curve at the lumbar. But looking at it, straight on, it should be a straight up and down kind of a model. Scoliosis is when the spine curves from side to side, and it can be what I just showed, which is probably incompatible with life, or it can be just a little bit. Um, and it's generally um, a congenital um, um, thing, so people are generally born with um, some scoliosis. What I do in my practice when people have pain from scoliosis is work not to correct the, the vertebrae because that's really not the kind of movement that we expect in manipulation. In manipulation, we're using very small movements. But in people with scoliosis, if they're curved like this, then the muscles on the convex side get stretched out and the muscles on the concave side get um, tight. And so you can use um, uh, manipulation to to um, get those muscles to move so that people are more mobile. Even though the spine um, itself might look the same, they're less uncomfortable and more mobile. So better function, better pain relief. What else? Actually, over there, I think. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so could you explain what a resident is and why that's Hey, that's a good idea. So, um, yeah, so, um, boy, that's just kind of my world. I kind of use, throw those terms around. So a medical student is in medical school. When they graduate from medical school, um, they are, um, they have a degree, either an MD or a DO. They can't practice medicine until they've done a residency. Residencies are anywhere from three to seven years, usually. Um, and it's um, just more intense training um, in both allopathic and osteopathic world, it used to be that the first year of that training was called an internship, and it was a rotating internship. So you did a little surgery, you little, did a little pediatric, you little, did a little bit of OBGYN, you did a little bit of family medicine. And that year-long um, training sort of prepared you to go out and practice. And then probably 20 years, 30 years ago, um, the MD world decided that one year wasn't enough. And so they started having longer residencies. So people would do that first year that was broad spectrum, and then they would go into their specialty. So either into surgery or into family medicine or into um, you know, some other specialty. The DOs hung on to that first year of internship a lot longer, but now pretty much everybody does um, just a residency. So then after residency, you take your boards and you become a licensed physician who can practice medicine. So you get your degree from medical school, you get your license from um, residency. Yeah. Yes? I'm going to let that go and ask oh. first, but I do have a question. Um, in, your, in your practice, as compared to maybe an MD, do you see more patients coming to you with mus musculoskeletal disorders and work-related injuries? Or would you say it's about the same? Yeah, in my, in my practice, um, I have... 
12, we have 12 faculty and 36 residents, and um, the osteopathic faculty and residents get um, more, of, more people with musculoskeletal um, complaints, um, which is sort of good and sort of bad. Um, you know, it's, um, we try really hard to make sure that our osteopathic residents in particular don't only get musculoskeletal problems because they've got such a broad scope of things that they need to practice. In my own personal practice with my own patients, um, so I have my own patients, I have uh, my own practice, and then I teach um, the residents. In my own practice, um, I do manipulation only on my own patients. So if a patient of mine comes in and they have a headache or they can't breathe or they have swollen legs or they've got back pain or something like that, I evaluate them and do manipulation when it's necessary. But I don't do, I don't accept people into my practice who are getting their medical care someplace else. Someplace else, somebody else is taking care of their diabetes and their hypertension and their whatever else, and they want to come to me just for manipulation because to me that's really not what osteopathic medicine is all about. So that's my own private practice, but um, osteopathic physicians run everywhere, as you said, from doing only manipulation to doing no manipulation, so it kind of depends. Do you, do you have a problem or concern with allopathic doctors who use those methods through other modalities, like physical therapists that do the counter strain? Or yeah, I'll tell you, when we have um, osteopathic medicine um, seminars at the residency, it's the MD one residents who always come to them. The, o, the DOs are all like, yeah, I heard that, been there, done that. The MDs are like, oh man, teach me that. So, um, so they, do, they learn um, some of our manipulation skills. Um, physical therapy is similar, a um, little bit different. Physical therapy tends to be a little bit more um, longitudinal, um, you know, kind of weeks of, of manipulation or of um, therapy. Yeah. Do you refer to uh, physical therapists I do refer to physical therapists and I do refer to massage therapists, both, um, again, sort of similar physical modalities but different than what um, I do. And sometimes um, there are some physical therapists in town who um, work really well with us um, and um, have um, sort of uh, worked out what I do and what they do, and that's very helpful. So it depends yeah. on what, what's presenting? Exactly, yeah. Yes? Um, I was just wondering, um, you said that uh, all the osteopath um, physicians, that, you know, uh, osteopaths have all of that knowledge plus. Um, that is coming, you realize, from an osteopathic physician, so, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we call the allopaths shallowpaths sometimes, but that's, you know, just between you and me. Yeah. Um, but that uh, all the osteopaths um, are adopting uh, physical manipulation more and more. So right. do you see a time coming when the two are going to converge and the distinction will be necessary? You know, that's, um, that's a really hot topic in our profession right now. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of a part of us that, that, that feels proud that people are finally noticing that we, what we do makes a difference and they want to incorporate that into their own practice. And then there's the minority side of us that wants to say, hey, you know, we, we were here first. Don't, don't suck us up into your big, you know, conglomerate. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's kind of a hot topic right now. Yeah? You haven't mentioned vitamins at all. Yeah, I, um, I haven't mentioned vitamins at all. Um, I don't think that that's an osteopathic or allopathic um, issue. I think that there, I mean, I think that, that vitamins are um, important, um, an important topic in medicine right now. Yeah, so I think, yeah, well, I think nutrition, um, again, I think that some allopathic physicians are great in nutrition. I think some osteopathic physicians are great. I think that all of us should be better. I think it's really, really important. Um, so I, I don't see that as a distinguishing factor between the allopaths and the osteopaths, but something that we should all get better um, at. You have a question back there? So, uh, you mentioned the philosophy being mind, body, and spirit. Uh, I don't know which, I would like to know what you mean about spirit. What kind of training do you have? How do you apply it? Um, for both uh, mental disorders and spiritual disorders. Do you take referrals within the clinic from other MDs? Uh, what uh, type of treatments do you offer above and beyond uh, MDs for osteoarthritis in the hips? 
Yeah, okay, so all sorts of good questions. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's already 5.30. Oh. So maybe the two of you could speak okay. privately about it. If you want to ask you questions on the floor, you know. Sure. Okay. Can I do a quick demonstration? Or is that too late? Okay, well, too late? Um, yeah. we would yeah. like to stop the question and answer period, but you're welcome to approach her afterwards to ask her whatever. She wants to do um, manipulation demonstration. Only if you want to see it. I, you know, just have this. All right. Wendy, you want to come up? Sure. So as I said, there's all sorts of techniques, and I'll just do a couple that just kind of show you. Can I get my shoes on? Yes, why don't you just kind of walk around there and then just sit here facing the audience. I you didn't know. skeletal problems that I need to... I didn't know this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> but it's okay, she's my doctor, so... So if you feel either by someone you're sitting next to or yourself, you take your fingers and feel the hard part of your skull, um, and then just kind of trace your fingers down your neck, you can feel differences. You can feel that it's different on one side or another. And that's just the asymmetry, and as long as it's not painful, it's not a big deal. But somebody who's having neck pain, and then I found something that was painful, like probably right in there. Um, it is now. <laughs> all sorts of techniques that I can use. One of them is really simple. So if this is the place that it hurts and I can feel it's sticking out more, it feels harder, it feels asymmetry, you know, those, the, the texture is different. And what I can do is to take Wendy's head and I can bend it forward, just relax, bend it forward a little bit, tell over it feels better. So I bend it a little bit, rotate it a little bit until that bump kind of disappears. Pushing as hard as I was before, but it shouldn't hurt as much as it Older in that position, um, she'd probably be a little more relaxed if this wasn't, you know, in front of the big audience. <laughs> Hold that position for about 90 seconds, yeah. and then kind of unwind, and that spot should disappear. So it's called counter strain. It's a really simple, easy kind of manipulation that we use a lot, especially in older people. Not that you're older. I'm just demonstrating. I am older. <laughs> I'm um, so was that muscle? What you were feeling was that muscle? Yes. Uh, and then a lot of times people have trigger bands that you can just kind of run up. That's the one that hurts. Uh, and then let me just do a muscle in it. Actually, I can back here. So if somebody came in with hip pain um, or lower extremity pain, what I usually do as part of a structural exam is to see if their legs are about the same length by checking out where their ankle bones are. Their ankle bones, when this ankle bone is down toward me just a little bit, so it seemed like this was a longer leg. And if I came up to the top and felt her hip bones, her hip bone is a little bit lower too, but it's probably not actually a longer leg. It's probably that the pelvis is tilted a little bit. And so we can do some muscle energy techniques to just kind of loosen up the pelvis and get the function better. One of the ones I'd like to show, because it usually shows a pretty good exam, the difference is you can bad use <laughs> Sorry, if we want to do it that way. So, you can take somebody's leg up to a barrier and then have her push into me. Push your knee. Relax. And I should be able to stretch it out farther. Push again. And I should be able to farther. So, what I'm doing is each time I push forward, I'm feeling a barrier. And I stop at the barrier and have her push against me. So she's in total control. It's not going to hurt her because she's the one who's doing the moving. And then I can push it. When, when she relaxes, I can push further through the barrier and further through the barrier. It really loosens up um, the posterior muscles. So anyway, those are just a couple of simple techniques. It um, doesn't take very long in the, in the office. <laughs> And then I mentioned plantar fasciitis and, um, and tennis elbow. Um, those are thinking that it's not the muscle or the bone that's the problem, it's the fascia. For those of you who are hunters, and I am not, but I hear that when you cut into an animal, you can see the fascia that covers the muscle and the bone and the tendons. That um, fascia, if it gets crumpled, 
crumples up not only the fascia, but also the nerves and the blood vessels and everything else that dives through it, and that causes pain. And that's that fascial distortion or crumpling of the fascia is what tends to be a problem in tennis elbow, plantar fasciitis, and we can kind of iron that out because, uh, and improve. So there you have it. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Don't go away without getting your free drink tokens, which I was supposed to have gotten ahead of time. And also the winning team, I'm sure you'll stick around for that. Sure. Okay, so next month it'll be hibernation, and December it'll be interstellar flight. Thank you for coming. Tell your friends. See you next month. <laughs>